My name is Tom Evans. Um, I have been a photographer in Yosemite for about 20 years. Before that, I climbed El Capitan several times myself, so I know what climbing is about, big wall climbing. Um, these days, I not only photograph climbers every day uh, during the spring and fall climbing seasons, but I also write a blog every night. And in the blog, I have uh, my 10 or 15 best pictures of the day and pictures that will explain what various teams are doing. So I write about who's climbing what, how well they're doing. If they're doing pretty well, I give them an attaboy. If they're not doing so well, I poke a little fun at them and uh, try to have a picture of every team uh, within uh, two or three days uh, when they're actually climbing. So big wall climbing has sort of drifted into the backwater. Well, with the El Cap report and all the photographs I put probably five or six hundred photographs a year doing their reports so people can see all these different climbs. I'd never seen the nipple pitch on Zodiac or anything, but now you can actually see that pitch on the El Cap report. So the things they dream about, they can see and they can read about climbers who are climbing them and they can quickly realize, wow, those guys aren't any better than I am. I can do that. And then that makes the dream happen for them. One of the things about the LCAP report that I didn't really realize was going to happen when I started it, I just basically started it for local news, for local people to check, and I thought, boy, if someday the whole sum of my efforts could amount to a thousand, p a thousand hits on my little site, that'd be so cool. Well, I get 2,000 hits a day now, and basically what happens is Billy and Bob are going to go climb Sea of Dreams or whatever climb they're going to do, and they say, oh, mom and dad, and girlfriend or husband or wife, whatever, uh, check the El Cap report every day and that you'll see how we're doing. And so I constantly get emails from mothers and fathers and loved ones saying, oh, thank you so much for putting out this report. You know, I thought climbing was kind of crazy, but it looks like it's not a, not, it's pretty reasonable activity. You have people climbing all the time. They're happy. They're doing well. And we can track our son. And if we are lucky enough that he makes the report a picture, then it, it's very important to them. So I get a lot of, of responses from parents thanking me for having their report in the first place. They're not imagining, you know, like, oh, Andy's in a faraway country and he's climbing this big rock and oh, rock climbing must be really dangerous. No, you see the picture of Andy and, and you, you read the commentary of a knowledgeable person. So we get a lot of that on the report now. I'm, I'm really happy for that. One always wonders what their place in the history of things they're interested in is going to be. And so I, when I first started out, it was sort of a local thing. And then I began to realize that, um, well, one of my, one of the young climbers that I was talking to one time, he said, yeah, I was, I came here 10 years ago and, and I, and I heard about you being there at the bridge. And I heard that you were the judge, the jury and the executioner of everything that happened on El Capitan, right? And so it turns out that I, I have had a tremendous impact on the sport of wall climbing because I try to do it in a lighthearted manner, but for a time people would, for some reason, take these extendable sticks with hooks on them and skip some of the aid placements just to go faster or to be, they didn't want to do that hook move so they would take a stick out and use it. A thing we call a cheater stick because it amounts to cheating when you're actually, if you're an aid climber, the sport is placing the gear. Well, if you stop, stop placing gear, then you stop being part of the sport. You've cheated. So nowadays it's extremely rare, rare to see a cheater stick because I would put the guy's photograph on the El Cap report and say stick of the day. And so other people realize, wow, if I use a stick and cheat, Tom's going to get a picture of me and put it on the internet. And so we laugh about it, everybody laughs at it. It's not serious, but it's enough to change the style of climbing, right? And that's one of the things I wanted to do. Another thing I wanted to do was have people be more efficient and take better care of the rock. Instead of pounding in a pin any time that you had a doubt, try a couple different kinds of placements. So um, as, far as, I, as far as I think now, I've had a great influence on rock climbing on El Capitan, and as a result, since the media now is so all-inclusive and everywhere, it's had a standard, it changed some of the standards around the world of what is expected of climbers. I'm not happy about the press that extreme kind of 
it's not just extreme, but it's it's something that you wouldn't want your son to do. You know, you wouldn't say, oh, Johnny, I'd like you to become a free solo. And you don't want that. So since we have this great equipment that now works so well and is so strong and safe, I'd like to see people use it more. You know, although the solo business is very small, very small number of people actually solo. But those are the people that we see getting killed, and so that really bothers me a lot. I, I get very attached to these people, uh, El Cap climbers, and some people say, "Wow, somebody was killed. Oh, too bad." And they, it bothers me. I, it, I, it grinds on my emotions. And in the last several years, we've had a lot of people killed, more than, more than for 15 years before when I was here. So we've had more deaths. There's more people, and so there's more likely. You know, statistically, there's more likely to be a fatal accident than there used to be. I used to tell tourists that the, they would say, oh, those climbers are up there, it's so dangerous. I would tell them, hey, it's more dangerous for you to drive home than it is for them to climb because they're generally experts for El Capitan. And so any idiot can kill you on a highway, but you have to be a highly trained idiot to be killed up there, right? So um, it's, it's not as safe as I'd like it to be anymore. But it's, it could be safe if people would use the equipment properly. And we do get climbers who want to climb El Cap, and they don't want to pay their dues. They don't want to do the Leaning Tower, the Washington Column, and build up to it. They say, oh, we've got this new gear, there's El Cap, Topo doesn't look too hard, let's go do it. And we still have a 50% rate of failure on El Cap. Half the people that go up there don't make it to the top within the first day or so down they come. Gee, we didn't, we weren't climbing very fast or couldn't move the bags, they're so big. It's another problem. When I first climbed it, we hardly took any, any, we had one small bag and that was it. Don't come here thinking that you're going to climb the nose because it's only C1. The logistics on the nose are what beats people on the nose. I've never seen anybody come down because they couldn't make the next placement. It's not technical. It's all the traverses and hauling the bag and arranging the belays. That stuff is the stuff you learn on easier, shorter climbs. So the nose is not, people say, oh yeah, that's an easy climb. Technically it's an easy climb, but it's a hard climb for your first climb. Part of, my, part of what I do here is whenever there's a rescue off of El Capitan, I stop what I'm doing and I photograph using all my various techniques and equipment, the entire rescue. Who, you know, with a camera, I give, the, I give one of the things I do is I give the photos to the park service, you know, just free, gratis. So they can then use the photographs and the time timeline that's on every photograph to figure out what they're doing, where they could improve, various other rescue techniques they could be using. And usually the members who are involved in some kind of a tragedy will come to me or I'll get to talk to them very soon after the event and we'll discuss what happened and then I'll write it up in the report and we'll talk about it at the bridge. Well, what happened? People will come up. What happened to that guy on the nose and, and you discuss it with them and say well what what did he do well he should have done this he should have done that and then you then I write something well okay folks the lesson here is don't do this or don't do that so remember that we don't want this to happen again so it's sort of like an airplane accident once once a plane crashes they find out exactly what happened and they correct things so it'll never happen again well we analyze rescues we talk about them we would like to have people become so aware that that type of accident will never happen again.